Hey, Chris. Hey, man, thanks. I'm happy to be here. happy to be plugging in now that this is going global. It's gone global, and I've noticed the book is right behind you. How many, what do you think, how many uh, books have you sold? We're, I haven't got the official tally domestic. I know globally we're over a million. Domestic, we're probably over a million now, too. Wow. How long did it take you to write the book? Uh, you know, once we kicked it into gear with Tall Roz, it was about a 10-month process. 10-month <clears throat> process, and then did you... Come on, you got to be honest. Did you expect it to be such a big seller? No, no, not at all. No. Because a lot of people well, say you write a book, writing a book and getting a book out, it's good for positioning, it's good for awareness, and it helps you in speaking. And if it's a big hit, which is super rare, it, it changes everything. So how has the book changed your life? Yeah, well, you know, God. Um, Making, feeling like I'm, I, I know this probably sound like bullshit, but feeling like we're, I'm really helping people all over, not just the U.S., but, you know, getting feedback from people in other countries that they're using it to make a difference in their life. That thing is really cool. It's just really gratifying. So I'm going to start with a negative, and I hate to do that. A few of my friends look at you and say the bad thing about Chris's book is it's a zero-sum game. It's one side wins. Is that what it is? Or is there a win-win opportunity in negotiating? No, actually, you know, you know, the flip side and never split the difference is if you want the, you know, your counterparts to be willing to accept that you might be completely right, you got to be open to the idea that they could be completely right too. You know, never split the difference is really just getting out of compromise. Compromise is the worst thing anybody could possibly do. I mean, it is horrible. So get out of compromise. But in a relationship, relationship now, not business, but a personal relationship, compromise is the key, especially in this quarantine world. Could you imagine being, living with someone you can't stand, you know, somebody that you were on the verge of getting a divorce from or on the verge of leaving and now you're quarantined with them, you have to work through compromise, right? <laughs> Sounds like another version of hell. Let me ask you a question. You remember, a, there used to be a cartoon in, in the newspapers a long, long time ago called The Lockhorns by a husband and a wife? Don't know it. And, and it was this great hand-drawn newspaper co cartoon, husband and wife, The Lockhorns. And the husband says to the wife one time, why don't we compromise? That way we'll both be unhappy. <laughs> you, I mean, you don't believe that. Compromise is the key, isn't it? Nah, I'm completely against compromise. Com here's, here's another great example of how, how screwed up compromise is. All right, Colin Kaepernick. Um, he was originally, when he started his protest in the NFL, he was originally just sitting out. He just sat on the bench. He wasn't taking a knee. And he took a meeting, got, you know, God bless him. Um, he took a meeting with a special forces guy. And the special forces guy said, look, um, you know, in the special forces, Taking a knee at the at the graveside of a fallen comrade was a way to show respect. So if you feel like you have to do something, you know why don't you at least take a knee? So his take a knee move was meant to show more respect for the U.S. Armed Forces. Nobody liked it. Both sides interpreted what he did as worse and made it even worse. That was a compromise move. And when you compromise, you completely lose what you were trying to get done in the first place. Okay. I can understand what you're saying there. So can you give us, and I hate to take something from you, but I believe you're going to add value. I think one of the biggest takeaways from you spending time with the metal community was the word no. How fast you get to know is really important, isn't it? Yeah, well, just flip it around. Um, get, get people, people want to say no anyway, and as stupid as it sounds, they want to say no, just change your question. You know, do things like instead of saying, do you agree, say, do you disagree? I mean, just, just flip it on its head. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a Jedi mind trick. I, I know, but most of us are in a negotiation not realizing that that no could have happened a long time earlier as opposed to us wasting time to get to that no. How can we accelerate the no? 
um, everybody's pretty much in the habit of asking questions that are designed to get people to say yes. I mean, any one of those questions, do you agree, can be do you disagree? Um, would you like to do this, say, is this a ridiculous idea? Um, uh, would you like to do some more of this? Uh, would you like to get back into this can be flipped to, have you given up on it? I mean, with a really s small amount of practice, every one of your yes questions can just be flipped to a no question, and you'll be astonished at the difference that it makes in the way people respond. Do you buy cars, or do you have someone do it for you? No, no, no. I, if, I, if I buy, I do it myself. You do. You walk in there. You know that they have their own process on trying to close you over and over again. Right, right, right. So we're all going to be in a negotiation situation when this thing's over. We're going to have to start going out, negotiating for possibly a new job, right? We're going to have to possibly negotiate for our old job to get back, to get it back. Um, maybe people are going to buy new homes because home prices are going to go down. We're all going to be in this new form of the negotiations. How do we dress up every day to be a great negotiator? What do we do? Yeah, you know, the, the hack is to articulate, you know, it's going to sound stupid, but articulate with the other person's point of view is especially, you got to hit on the negative stuff. I mean, it's not that everybody's going to be in a negotiation when they're all, uh, when this is all over, everybody's in a negotiation now. I mean, there is more, everybody's negotiating. There's more renegotiating going on. Everybody out there, they're either renegotiating because they have to, or their advisors are telling them, call up everybody you know and renegotiate everything you've got. You know, whether you like it or not, this is, this is probably the most intense period of time of renegotiation that's going on globally. Everybody is in the midst of it now. So, landlord, you have rent that's due in, in, in a month from now. How do you negotiate with your landlord? Yeah, well, the, the, actually, and to, to some degree, landlord negotiation is relatively easy because the government is getting ready to step in and make them stop collecting rent anyway. I mean, there's, there's rent moratoriums that are hitting the media across the board. And the landlord's negotiation really now is, you know, what tenants do I want to be left with? How bad does my relationship want to be with this tenant when this is over? Because can't con it's a bad idea to condition people that they can't pay rent at all. You want to keep people conditioned in the idea that they got to do something to maintain the relationship. So the landlord negotiation is just to kick it into gear with your landlord. Um, you know, how can we keep this relationship going so that we don't hate each other when this is over? That's how you open the dialogue? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, no, nobody wants to be back in, completely back into a corner here where people are going to court because nobody's going to be able to go to court to fix anything for quite some time as soon as the dust begins to settle. And the dust is actually starting to settle out. Henrik says, uh, defer rent, so uh, do later. Uh, I think he says, defer rent, push it off, add it to the month after or something like that. All right, so Chris, we're going to go get the book. What three things are we going to get from the book if we haven't read it before? What three takeaways are we going to get? You know, how to say no gently. First of all, you know, the real, the real key figure is how to, how, uh, how to let out no a little at a time. It's actually the first story in the book is how to say no nicely in a way that preserves a relationship. And people stay in collaboration, problem solving, collaborative mode. Okay. Say no easily. Number two. You know, hear the other side out. I mean, never be so sure of what you want that you wouldn't take something better. I mean, how do you get something better? You got to hear the other side out. And if they say something that you really like, then you go like, wow, what a great idea. And they, they don't realize that you, you got them to suggest something that you wanted all along. Dimitri in the chat group says he's read the book five times. <laughs> what would be a third thing you would get from the book? Yeah, you know, it'll teach you how to accelerate success how to how to not leave money on the table and and simultaneously how to not destroy relationships most of the time when you're trying to get everything on the table you can the other side feels really stung they feel lost they feel beat up they don't want to deal with you anymore i mean really how, how to how to how to max it out without making the other side feel exploited 
So if somebody studies you, really gets into everything that you preach and teach, and you find out and you have to negotiate with them, what happens? What's that situation like if they know all your tricks? Yeah, well, that's everybody in my company. I mean, the real issue is not does somebody know your tricks. What are they trying to do now? We can sniff out real fast what the other side's trying to do, whether or not they're trying to cheat us, whether they're trying to get something for nothing, whether or not they genuinely want to collaborate. People use my stuff on me all the time. I don't mind it if they're not trying to cheat me. And if they're trying to cheat me, I just stop talking to them. <laughs> Last thing, I want to congratulate you because it, in the, the speaker space, because you've become a, a coveted speaker, it was, if you had a TED Talk, you're at the top of everything, a TED Talk. Now it's, if you have a master class, you are at the top of everything. Your master class, I was told, is actually one of the most popular of all master classes now. That's incredible. Last, last month, it was the most popular master class on their site, which is a sign of the apocalypse. No. <laughs> It's actually a really good class. It's fun to watch. I know Bill Dorfman, who's we we have a a group that we we share ideas amongst one another. He started watching, and Bill goes, "This thing was incredible, right, Bill? You, you love that class, Chris. I want to thank you for sharing time with us. And uh, I know that you're. I think you're in Vegas. And Vegas, I'm not sure is a lot of. It's probably not fun when you can't do anything in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, nothing, nothing that you have to keep to yourself because nothing's gonna happen. There's right nothing going to happen. You can't get in trouble. Chris Voss, thanks a lot for being part of Metal today. Thanks for having me on, Ken.